Well, good morning and welcome. Here we are at the last day of the year 2020, and I don't think any of us will miss uh, thinking about this calendar year. And yet I think it's also point, uh, important for us to recognize that even though there have been some very, very difficult challenges and, and frustrations and disappointments, that God uses all of that in our life. He, it, it's not there by just mistake. You're not particularly unblessed uh, because you're living in America. God puts you here and he has you here for a purpose. And we should learn and grow from the things that we've had to learn and grow from. And that'll make us more effective. And that was what we were talking about the last couple of days, that God wants us to have a distinct and unique response to the challenges that we face every day because we're intended by God to be salt and light in the world. And as Jesus continued on in the sermon, one of the things he, he kind of shifts from, as we talk about a different way of uh, perceiving ourselves in the world to a different way of engaging the world, we start thinking about the world differently. And thought process is really important because what we think really will lead us to what we believe and what we believe will control how we act and behave. And so when we begin to think about things, not from a worldly or a cultural, social way, but we begin to think of them biblically, we see the world through the lens of Scripture, that changes our interaction with the culture, which is exactly the thing he states here in chapter 5, verse 17 of Matthew's Gospel, when he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And he goes on, he says, I, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do them, same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know that's an awful lot of information to cover, and I'll try to do it in as accurate and as swift a manner as possible. But the first thing is Jesus makes clear, I haven't come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. The law itself, from Genesis to, to uh, Malachi, is really a book that not only records historical realities, but it's also prophetic. It's foretelling. And that's why the, the Jews talked about the Bible. They divided it into two categories, the law and the prophets. And later on, they added the writing. But essentially, they saw it all as being prophetic and foretelling what the kingdom of God was going to look like on earth. And uh, Jesus said, I came to fulfill all of those promises. I didn't come to destroy them. I came to fulfill them. Now, the point is that once you've filled a cup and there's no more room to fill it, then you're done. And essentially, he's taped, we call the New Testament the New Testament because not that it has replaced the Old Testament, but the thing is we can only understand the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Otherwise, we will just become legalists and think we're saved by our hard work, which is where much of Judaism is today. But as Christians, we recognize the gospel of grace that Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that is to fulfill the righteousness of the law. So um, it really becomes important for us to understand that we read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. And that's why he would go on to say that nothing, even the slightest little pen mark, is not going to disappear from the law because it's, it's something that has an eternal dynamic to it. And Paul would say the law is good and it's right and it's spiritual in chapter 7 of Romans. So when I talk about the Ten Commandments, which is really the central platform or, or pillar of, of the entire book of the law, it basically tells me these are things that are non-negotiables. You shall not lie. You shall not have other gods. You shall not worship idols. You shall not steal. You shall not cheat, lie, commit adultery, murder, uh, and you'll keep the Sabbath day holy. Now, the Sabbath day has become the one that's been the real sticker for a lot of people because they're saying, well, we need to therefore keep the Sabbath just as the Jews kept the Sabbath. Well, first of all, the Jews were never successful at that, and nor have any Christians who are trying to do it kept it as it's commanded to be kept. Even today in Israel, it's an impossibility to keep the Sabbath the way the Jews kept the Sabbath in the first century or even before then. And so as a result, what we find is we're kind of trying to import our modern ideas on something that not only is ancient, but also is not really the whole point, because the writer of Hebrew later on makes it clear that the Sabbath is found in Christ. 
so that every day is holy, Paul said to the Romans. That essentially means that every day is a Sabbath day in my life, that I've ceased from my own labors and I've entered into his labors. Now, I, I would not argue that this, it's a good idea to take one day out of seven off from our busy schedules because that has a certain uh, physiological dynamic to it that our bodies cannot go constantly without breaking down, which explains why a lot of people are having some of the health and mental problems they have because they're just running from pillar to post. They're pressing the metal to the pedal or the pedal to the metal 24-7, and they wonder why they are confused and exhausted and frustrated and depressed depressed and all the rest. We need to step back, but and particularly we need to step back and take a rest where we allow God to speak into our life. And I think that should be something not that happens just once a week. I think it has to happen every day, that every day we need to have a moment in time in which we can just sit back and really experience a Sabbath with God. And I would say to teach something other than that is, is, is really reprehensible because we need to teach people to learn how to access the Sabbath of God, not just once a week, but every day of the week. And that our righteousness does not exist in whether we keep the Sabbath any more than it means whether or not we're circumcised, which are both, we're told in Exodus 32, is a, is a covenant relationship with Israel and God, not with the Gentiles and God. But aside from all of that, Anybody that teaches people to live immorally, which that's what he means. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be great in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches otherwise, he says, well, they're going to be cursed. <laughs> and uh, he, he basically, when you look at a world where they're promoting immorality, the violation of the Ten Commandments and all of the other law. Well, God says you have to understand that those people are predisposing themselves, setting themselves up in a place of judgment. It's like building your, your house on top of a volcano. Sooner or later, uh, you're going to lose all. And so that's why that's how we understand that. But it's really beginning to think uh, holistically in our Christian life. But I'll continue on. Uh, got one more this week, and we'll wrap it up, and, and hopefully I can tie some of these things together. So God bless you, go in his grace.